going to continue our series tonight on, on the Beatitudes. And once again, if you're here tonight, I'm, I'm assuming um, that, that you have a walk with God, that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. And if you're here tonight and you haven't made that decision yet, I would encourage you to do so. It's a really, really good decision to make, that, that you make that decision to follow Jesus Christ. But, but, but for, for Sunday night, um, I'm just making an assumption that most of you are here because you're hungry to learn something out of the Word and, and to, to examine your heart. And so what I'm going to teach tonight, um, I'll give you a forewarning, um, is, is going to require a lot of introspection. What I felt like the Lord said to me about this is that your healing would come through repentance. That actually wholeness would be given as a gift through repentance. That sometimes healing and wholeness is given through the laying on of hands or God just miraculously doing something or through a process. But tonight, I really felt like he said that as we examine our hearts to become more Christ-like, it would be coming through repentance. And so we're in this series on the Beatitudes and there's this woman and she thinks that if she can just put an ocean between her and her problems, that they would go away. But what she finds is, is that as she changes her geography, everywhere she goes, she's there. And actually the problem goes with her. And she's, all she's trying to do is be happy. There's this lady and she's a good hearted person. And her husband didn't mean to get in the accident that almost crippled him. And her husband can't work and provide like he used to. And they didn't have proper insurance. And so they've had to move out of their house in the suburbs into a very low income area just to survive. And that and the pressure of the three kids are getting to her. And she doesn't know if she can take it one more day. So, so one night she's sitting there and someone told her that a little bit of whiskey would take the edge off. And so she takes some whiskey and she puts it in a glass and it's too strong. So she mixes it with some Coke just to take the edge off, not to be a bad person or anything like that. She just needs some relief. And someone told her that would give her relief. So she, she takes a bit of it and it provides a little bit of taking the edge off. But before she knows it, she's doing it every night. And before she knows it, it takes more and more to take the same edge off. And before she knows it, the very thing that used to help her life is actually now driving it. And she's sitting back and wondering, how did I get here? I was just trying to be happy. I was just trying to be happy. And so Jesus realizes that the basic questions of life, who am I, why am I here, where am I going, that all that actually can get summed up in one question, what will make me happy? That the driving force behind all of our behaviors are things that we think either guided or misguided will make us happy. So in Jesus, his first sermon, he's, he, he's, his first sermon, his, he, it's, it, he's right out of the whole rabbi gate. We talked about that this morning and I hope you enjoyed that this morning and, and really it opened up some things for you. He's right out of the rabbi gate and he said, okay, before we go anywhere, I'm just going to answer this question about what it means to be happy. What, what, in my yoke, what does it mean to be happy? And, and let me remind you of a couple things. The people Jesus is speaking to are common people in the lowest economic sector of the Jewish world. They're just commoners. Number two, the Beatitudes are about Jesus' ideas about the kingdom of God and who partakes in it. Who partakes in it? Number three, the Beatitudes are written form of Hebrew poetry where each characteristic is describing the same type of person. So the poor in spirit and the meek and, and the, the people who hunger and thirst for righteousness and the merciful, these are all the same type of people. And this is Rabbi Jesus' yoke and it's as a commentary on Isaiah 61 and 66. And we're going to bring those scriptures, keep bringing them in and interweaving them in. And remember, as by way of review from last night, the word blessed, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. And, and he uses this word nine times. The word blessed is not Baruch. There's two types of blessing. The first blessing is Baruch, which is a blessing from God or to God. It's God initiating something on us, or we are initiating something towards God. That is Baruch. The word he uses is Ashrei. Which, which, is, which, is a, a, which is a type of blessing that is more better translated um, happiness. Happiness as a result of making the right decisions. And we, we, we made a case last night. We showed you a lot of different uses of that word. And all of them have to do with choosing to walk in the way of the Lord. Choosing to, to walk in his yoke, in his way of living. That when we choose that, actually that makes us happy. And so the better translation is, is happy. Now with that as the backdrop, let's go to the next set of Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, 7, and 8. Blessed are they, or happy are they, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is if you look at the screen there, uh, verse 6 and verse 8 are essentially saying the same thing. We talked about this last night. This is a very common Hebrew literary mechanism where you put bookends that say the same thing in the middle of something that's a key thought. So it says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. And then verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So in essence, he's saying the people who hunger and thirst after righteousness, those are the pure in heart. And the people who hunger and thirst and, and seek righteousness are the same people as the pure in heart. And they will see God. And in seeing God, they will be filled up. That this that, that is basically essentially saying the same thing. Now, we don't have time tonight to do all three of these. I'm just going to do the bookends. And we're going to do Blessed are the Merciful on Tuesday night. And we're going, to do, we're going to do a different set on Tuesday morning. But Tuesday night, I'm going to talk about blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. But tonight, I'm going to talk to you about what it means to hunger and thirst after righteousness. One of these days, I'm going to do a whole series on righteousness. But tonight, I could do six, eight CDs on it. But tonight, I'm just going to hit one aspect of it that hopefully will hit us in our heart. I want you to notice there's, there's an interesting, besides the structure, there's an interesting sort of play on words. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. The word filled there is the same word to be filled up in your stomach. It's not some sort of super spiritual thing. It's actually to be filled up in your stomach. And it makes sense. He's, he's using a euphemism around hungering and thirsting, and he's saying you're going to be satisfied. It's actually something that fills your stomach. And so what is righteousness? What is righteousness? And, and, and what is pure in heart? And how do they go together? And what does it mean for us today? So I'm going to answer two questions tonight. What is righteousness? And, and what is pure in heart? And, and how can we examine our life for that today? Now, I'm going to open up with the, with the pure in heart. What does it mean to be pure in heart? Now, to understand this, we have to understand two key phrases, okay? And, and look, we're going, to, we're going to do the same thing we did tonight as we did this morning, okay? When I ask you to repeat something, I want you to repeat it with some go wallabies gusto, okay? Some real, some real gusto. Now, the first word I want you to, to understand that we have to really get our head around in order to understand pure in heart is the Hebrew concept called tame. Can you say that word with me? Tame. Can you say it again? Tame. The, uh, the second word that we have to get our head around in order to understand this idea of pure in heart is the word tehor. Can you say that one with me? Tehor. Can you say it again? Tehor. In, in the Hebrew version of Matthew, it says, blessed or happy or the tehor in heart, for they will see God. So you got this idea of tame and tehor. Now, tame meant unclean, contaminated, or impure. Unclean, contaminated, or impure. And, and, and here was the problem with Tame. Tame was very contagious. Let me tell you what I mean. Tame was anything that made you unclean. Now, we define sin in a Western culture. We define sin very poorly, and we also define righteousness very poorly. We're going to talk about that in a second. We define sin as the bad things we do. And if sin is the bad things we do, then if we don't do those bad things, then we are righteous. That's how the logic goes. If sin is the bad things we do, and we don't do that set of bad things, then we're righteous. Of course, every group of people has their own set of bad things. And so who's right and who's wrong? In the South, I grew up in the South in America, and 40 years ago, you would go to hell if you drank wine, but you could hate black people, that was okay. Now that's odd. That's odd. That's a weird sort of way to define righteousness and unrighteousness. So we define unclean as a set of bad things that we do, and then if we don't do those bad things, then we're righteous. And that is nowhere even close to how they would have understood it. Tame is not the bad things that we do. Oh, let me just rephrase that. Tame is the bad things that we do, but it is much, much, much bigger than that. Tame was anything that wasn't perfect. Uh, the Bible says that, that Leviticus and, and, and the, the law, the Torah, which by the way, let me just attack that for a second. Um, the, to call the Torah law is a really, really, really bad translation. Um, the, the word Torah just means God's teachings for the best kind of life. In, in other words, it was, it, the, the, Torah, the whole point of the Torah was, if you live this way, you will have the best life. It had nothing to do with God liking you or not liking you. It never had, never was. It had nothing to do with that. The, the, the whole point, Paul later said, anyone who tries to, to get righteous by keeping the law only, only makes himself aware of where he broke it. That the whole point of the Torah was not about making you okay with God. It was just giving you some standards points that says this is the best way to live this is it 
And so Paul said that one of the reasons the Torah was given is so we would know what sin is and what makes us unclean. And, and if you look at the book of Leviticus, um, it, it seems like everything was a sin. I mean, it was a sin to have dandruff. It made you tame to have dandruff. So God, check your neighbor right now and see, see how they're doing. It was a sin to have dandruff. If you, if you had dandruff, you had to bring a sin offering to atone for that. It, it was a sin to wear eyeglasses. Because if you had dim eyesight, it wasn't perfect. And so you became Tame. It, it was a sin to have a period. So, so if you're here tonight and, and you're on your period, you would be unclean. And actually, no one would be allowed to touch you. So if you could just kindly let us know who you are. <laughs> if you could just slip your hand in the air. We don't want to embarrass anybody here, but we don't, you know. <laughs> It was a sin to have a period because, because a period was, was, a, was a, an outward sign of, of sin. It was, it was, you were never supposed to have periods. That was something that came as a result of sin. So, so yes, yes. <laughs> Amen. There's always one competing with you. So, so it, it was a sin to have a period. It was a sin to give birth. It was a sin to give birth. So it says this in Leviticus 12, 6 and 7. After a woman gives birth, she must bring a sin offering to atone for her loss of blood. Why? Because you were never intended to have pain in childbirth. To have pain in childbirth was a result of sin. Therefore, it was sinful. It made you TMA. And the problem with TMA was it was contagious. So, so that if, if you're here tonight and you're on your period and, and, and I brushed your arm, I would become Tame and have to offer sacrifices. If you're here tonight and you have dandruff and, and I touched you then, then, then you, then you and I both would be unclean and we would have to offer sacrifices. And, and they took this so far. Everything, it was then become, it was a sin to touch furniture where a woman who had had her period had sat in the last three days. So if you don't want to raise your hand, at least leave a sign in your seat. <laughs> if you just let us know, don't touch this chair for three days. It became a sin to touch furniture where a married couple had been intimate in the last three days. What'd you do, put a sign up? <laughs> I was teaching this in a pastor's house one time. He made everybody get off the couch. He was like 75. I'm going, what? This is, this is fantastic. You are my hero. He never wore skinny jeans. So this was the concept of Tame. Tame was unclean and it was very contagious. So, so when you read in the New Testament about people who had um, issues of bleeding for 12 years, it meant that they were Tame for 12 years, which means that they would not have been purposely touched in 12 years. Can you imagine the pain they would have lived with? When, when you read things about crippled people, Crippled people were not allowed in the temple. Why? Because they were imperfect and permanently so. They could never be declared Tehor. Teme was unclean. Tehor meant clean. And, and so, so God gave us this thing to, to try. What the, the writer of Hebrews later says is, is that the whole thing really wasn't to help God. It was actually to appease our own conscience. That, that we actually needed to be able to walk closer with God. But they did something. What was meant to be gracious to help us understand peace with God, they did something that was horrific. And they created a complicated system of who was in and who was out. Who was saved and who was not. They, they, they developed this complicated system of, okay, these people are in and these people are out. Sounds like us, doesn't it? We've been given the ultimate grace of God, yet we spend our time debating who's in, who's out. I, I hear people, people ask me all the time because they think I'm smart. You've got to understand, I've said everything I know. <laughs> you know so don't look for anything new. 
I, I, they, they, they say, Shane, is such and so, are they going to heaven when they die? And I'm like, I always answer it the same way. That is way above my pay grade. Can we please leave that with God? As a matter of fact, I would suggest that the people we think are out are actually the ones in. And the people we think are in are actually the ones out. There's this one time, um, Jesus goes into this town in Galilee, and they ask him this question. They say, Rabbi, are only a few going to be saved? And of course, who did they mean? Themselves. Rabbi, tell us, are only a few going to be saved? In this, this area in Galilee, they were known for their extreme orthodoxy. They, 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 they made the Torah even harder than it was, and they kept it. And they said, we're the righteous one. They actually called themselves the remnant or the elect. Sounds like us. And they said, Rabbi, are only a few going to be saved? And he is so mad. He says, listen, at my banqueting table, many will come from the north, east, south, and west. But you who actually think you're in will be the one shut out because you think you're better than other people. So, so they took Tamay and Tehor. And instead of taking it for what it was, what was the point of Tamay and Tehor? The point of Tamay and Tehor was we need a savior. And we need to experience the grace and the compassion of God. But instead of taking that, they took it and they developed a complicated system of who was in and who was out. And, and guess who was out? The marginalized, the afflicted, the crippled, the lame, the people who were blind. The, these people, prostitutes, tax collectors, fishermen, because they handled dead fish all the time. They were perpetually tame. So Jesus shows up and he wrecks their system. He shows up and he does things like touch lepers. He, he, does things, he does things like touch women with an issue of bleeding. One place he went in and grabbed a dead girl by the hand. We're not allowed to do that. He's wrecking their system. In other words, what he's saying is, is you have spent your whole life developing this system of who's in and who's out. And I'm here to tell you, you are wrong. You're wrong. That, that righteousness, pure in heart, Tehor has nothing to do with what you've made it. You've made it all about outward things and what you do and what you don't do. And I'm here to tell you that pure in heart has everything to do with who you are on the inside. So he said things to, to paralyze people like, like your sins are forgiven. In, in Hebrew, he would have said, let that which is tame be made tehor. Let that which is called unclean be called clean. So, so it says, blessed are the clean, but blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And, and he parallels that with this idea of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Listen to this scripture, Matthew 5, verse 20. This is later on uh, in the same sermon. This is what he says. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the Torah, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's a stunning observation, isn't it? You have to be more righteous than the Pharisees? No one was. What's he saying? He's saying this. It is impossible to be righteous that way. There has to be another way. So then what is righteousness? What is righteousness? How can we redefine that? How can we understand that the way they would have understood it? Well, number one, righteousness is not a word about withdrawing from evil. We tend to define righteousness as things we do not do. Smoke, drink, chew tobacco, see bad movies. Don't dress immodestly. How do you wear your hair? How, how, do you, how do you present yourself? What sort of outward things? Don't present yourself in certain ways. Don't commit certain sins. We, we, try, we try to define righteousness as all the things we don't do. So, so, so someone could say, okay, I've never smoked, I've never drank, I've never chewed, I, I, I've never seen a bad sort of movie, I, I've never committed adultery, I, I've never gossiped or slandered. So, so, so they define these things, I've never done these things, therefore I am righteous. And that has nothing to do with what this word signifies. Not like, look, if, if you want to live your whole life not doing anything bad, that is a good thing. You ought to keep not doing bad things, it will make for a better life. But it has nothing to do with righteousness. Absolutely nothing to do with it. That righteousness is not withdrawing from evil. Listen, goodness is not the absence of badness. That's as simple as I can say it. That you could do nothing wrong your whole life and still have done nothing. You do nothing wrong your whole life and still essentially has done nothing. That righteousness is not the absence of wickedness. Righteousness, this is a word about entering into something. Righteousness has something to do with what we enter into. 
It, it has something to do in, in two levels. One, there's a certain righteousness that is given to us in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that God does not impute sin to us. In Romans chapter 4, it says God will not impute sin to us. In another place, Paul restates it another way. He says that God chooses not to count your sins against you. In other words, it's not that you don't sin. It's just your sins don't count. Not in heaven. Not on the, in the ultimate audit of life. Your sins just don't count. There's a righteous debt. But, but they believe something deeper. They believe that since you've been given righteousness, that it should manifest itself in something here. That there's a certain righteousness you will never be able to attain here, but there's a certain level of righteousness that you can. To show forth what God has done. And, and number three, all through scriptures, all through scriptures, um, there is a connection between righteousness and generosity. Righteousness and generosity. Let me show you the two words. Let me show you the word for righteous. The word for righteous is the word sadak. Let me hear you say sadak. All right, and that's righteousness. Now remember, the Hebrew language was originally pictures. Every Hebrew letter is a picture, therefore every Hebrew word is a comic strip. Without going into it for time's sake, just trust me, this is what it says. In the picture Hebrew, the comic strip reads this. The desire of one's heart opens the door to humility. The desire of one's heart opens the door to humility. In, in other words, it goes all the way back to the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The desire of your heart has nothing to do with what you do or don't do. It has to do with your pursuit of God in your heart. The desire of one's heart opens the door to humility. The desire of one's heart. Now that's the word righteousness or righteous. Let me show you the word generosity. The word generosity is tzedakah. Do you see how they are related? It's the same exact word. Sadak is righteousness. Sedaka, which is only, they add an H to it, is generosity. The Hebrew picture on this says, the desire of one's heart opens the door to humility revealed. In other words, that, that righteousness revealed was generosity. And, and this connection in scripture, I was sitting with a rabbi once on an airplane. I'd never met him before we got to talking. He said, Shane, to a rabbi, it is impossible to be greedy and righteous. You cannot be greedy and righteous. You cannot be. It is not possible. You cannot be given the righteousness of God in Christ and, and not manifest itself in a heart of generosity. It is not possible. He started challenging me with a lot from Jesus' teachings on it. You look through Jesus' life, and he was very, very compassionate on people caught in the act of adultery. Thieves on crosses, prostitutes, tax collectors, fishermen, all manner of sinners. He, he was very compassionate with those people. But he said there was a rich man, and he overlooked a poor man. That's the guy that goes to hell. That's the guy that ends up in hell. It's the only time Jesus ever said the word Hades in terms of somebody going there. That's it. It's a rich man who overlooked a poor man. That guy goes to hell. As a matter of fact, there's only one person in Jesus' whole ministry, who did something so unspeakably heinous that God killed him. And it was the man who had more than enough food. And Jesus said, what are you going to do with all your surplus of food? And he said, I'm going to build bigger barns and store it up for myself so that my soul can have peace. I'll know I can be able to eat. And Jesus said, oh, God's going to kill you for that. Surely tonight God will require your life from you. I mean, all these people Jesus dealt with, and Jesus, he met a lady divorced five times and was shacked up with the sixth one. And he's like, can I get you a drink of water? <laughs> You're all right, can we just talk? I, I, this can't be the best, but can we just talk? I don't condemn you. Don't, don't, just go and sin no more. I, no, no, no. But, but he said, there's this guy who has more than enough food, and he left hungry people outside. That guy, God's going to kill him. That, that righteousness and generosity always go hand in hand. So he says, blessed, happy are those who hunger and thirst to be generous. That they hunger and thirst to show righteousness to other people. Even today in Turkey, beggars will sit on the side of the road and they will say, Sadaka, 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 show me righteousness, show me righteousness, show me righteousness, feed me, I cannot eat without your help. It was righteousness. Revealed. Let me just show you a bunch of scriptures with that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is full of light, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is full of evil, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. In, in, ancient, in the ancient Near East, in the ancient Hebrew culture, to say someone had an eye full of light meant they were generous. 
To say someone had an eye full of evil meant they, were, meant they were stingy. So to say to someone, don't give me the evil eye, that means don't be stingy with me. It means don't, don't, be, don't be greedy with me. Actually help me. There's this one proverb I love. It says this. This is Solomon. He's a very wise guy. He said this. He, he, he said, he said if, don't withhold until tomorrow if it's within your power to meet the person's need today. For their need means more to them than you. In other words, if someone's hungry and you could feed them, feed them today. Don't tell them come back tomorrow because they've got to sleep all night with an empty belly. No, no, no. If it's within our power to meet their need, meet it today. Meet it today. Righteousness and generosity hand in hand. Listen to Matthew 6.1. This is, this is just the same sermon of the Beatitudes just carried on. Matthew 6, 1, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness. The word there is tzedakah. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then he goes on to talk about acts of righteousness being given to the needy. It's it's tzedakah. Listen to the book of Psalms. One writer in the book of Psalms, chapter 37, verse 25, says this, I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. All the day long, he deals generously and lends freely. And his seed is blessed. And his seed is blessed. So out of all the adjectives, out of all the adjectives that David could have used to describe a righteous man, he says you can always tell a righteous man because that's the guy dealing generously. Righteousness, generosity, hand in hand. Even in the language, sadak, sadaka, righteousness, generosity, greed, wickedness. Remember, Jesus had this encounter with some people. He said, you foolish Pharisees, you make the outside of your cup and platter clean, but the inside is full of greed and wickedness. He didn't just say wickedness. He said greed and wickedness. It's always greed and wickedness, generosity and righteousness, generosity, righteousness, greed, wickedness, greed, wickedness, generosity, righteousness, all through scripture. Generosity and righteousness are inextricably connected. You cannot separate the two. Greed and wickedness are inextricably connected. You cannot separate the two. Listen to Psalm 112 verse 5. It says this, A righteous man shows generosity and lends freely. He will guide his business with fairness. Once again, righteousness, generosity. In Isaiah chapter 1, God is... um, Speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he's talking about church. They, they, they had done, they're doing their church services and assemblies and festivals. They're doing everything that God has called them to do. And God says, your, your sacred assemblies and your festivals make me sick. Now, these, these were God's ideas. And they were just doing God's ideas like he said. But he says, they make me sick. And watch what he says to them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Now watch the solution. Watch what he tells them. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. Once again, the issue was generosity. It was generosity. It it was the wickedness was, was greed and overlooking the needs of other people. In Luke chapter 3, there's this guy named John the Baptist. And John the Baptist has no people skills. He he, he does things like eat bugs dipped in honey, things like this. I mean, how do you deal with somebody like that? And it says that a group of people came out to be baptized by him. They didn't come out to have a go at him. They, They came out to be baptized by him. And this is what he says to them. You brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourself, you have Abraham as your father. For I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. So his first greeting to this group of people is, you basket of snakes, you fatherless people. There's a bad word for that. It starts with a B. You don't want to call people that. Does it lend itself to church growth? It says, you basket of snakes, you fatherless people. It gets worse. This gets worse. He says, the axe has already fallen to the root of the trees, and every one of you will be cut down and thrown into fire. This guy is a Pentecostal pastor on speed. (laughs) Now, what would you think the sin of these people are? Basket of snakes. Fatherless people. 
You, 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 the axe is cutting you off and throwing you into fire. What would you think their sin was? Addiction, fornication, adultery, homosexuality. One of the big ones, right? Not the ones, not the stuff we overlook like pride and anger and things like this. Like it's really, really bad to, to have those sins in your life. But I think it's even worse to think you're better than people with those sins in your life. Can I get an amen? Like somebody asked me once, Shane, what happens to my husband? He's hooked on porn. Will he go to hell? And she said it like, I want him to go to hell. <laughs> and I went, well, I mean, can we get him some help? Or He's beyond help. <laughs> what happens to him? I, I want to know if he goes to hell. And I said, well, I, that's once again, it's above my pay grade. Um, what happens to a woman who thinks she's better than someone who struggles with an addiction. I mean, what are we talking about here? Is pride worse than that? I mean, what, what, are, we, what are we dealing with here? So, so John the Baptist goes crazy. You brood of vipers, you fatherless people, you, the ax has fallen to the root of your trees. And watch what the sin was. The crowd says, what do you want us to do? I mean, what do we do? What should we do then? The crowd asks. In other words, hey man, chill out. Hey, just tell us what you want us to do. And this is John's answer. The man with two tunics should share with him who has none. And the one with food should do the same. Once again, generosity. Generosity, righteousness, hand in hand. Wickedness, greed, hand in hand. I'm going to read you a scripture that changed the way I do life forever. It's in Matthew 25, verse 31 to 45. Before I read the scripture, I want to remind you, these are Jesus' last words in public. As soon as this sermon's over, he gets arrested and crucified. This is his last public sermon. And he's trying, if you read Matthew 23, 24, 25, he's trying to get everything out. And he's all over the place. Hey, there's this fig tree and it doesn't bear fruit. Don't be like that. There's this guy with talents and da-da-da-da-da. Hey, in the end of the age, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And I'm, I'm coming back on a date no man knows the day or the hour of. And he's trying like a Gatlin gun to get all this stuff because he knows they're coming. This is his last words, what I'm fixing to read to you. These are his last words, very important. This is what it says. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations shall be gathered before him and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. So he's saying, hey, this is about the end of the age when I'm standing in front of everybody and everybody's going to be judged by me. This is how, he's screaming at the top of his voice, this is how I'm going to judge people. This is it. Let me let you in on it. And indeed, he shall set the sheep on his right but the goats on his left. And then the king shall say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? For when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous, there it is, generous righteousness. Then the righteous shall answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, in other words, look at their heart. They're going, wait a minute. We didn't know that was you. We were just doing it because it was the right thing to do. We didn't even know you were there. And the king shall answer them and say, truly I say to you, and as much as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? For when I was hungry, you gave me no food. When I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. When I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was sick, you didn't prison, you didn't visit me. And then they will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them and say, truly I say to you, and as much as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And this is the last line of the sermon. And then he gets arrested. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. So in Jesus' last words, what's true of the righteous? They were generous. What's true of the wicked? They were greedy. And my question to you tonight is this. 
If you had to stand before Jesus today, would you be on the right or would you be on the left? Would you be on the right or would you be on the left? Are you a person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness? Are you a person who hungers and deeply desires to fill the bellies of those who can't fill their own, understanding that God will fill yours? That's what this scripture is all about. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 1 and 2. I love this. So, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is a huge play on words. In that culture, outside the synagogues, they had offering plates. Now, they took an offering every week, but every day there was offering plates sat on the street outside the synagogues. These offering plates were meant for one thing. They were meant for collections for the poor. It was almsgiving to the poor. The offering plates at the street were shaped like a trumpet. They were very wide at the top and narrow at the bottom so people couldn't get their hands in. Very wide at the top and narrow at the bottom. And there was a group of people and these group of people, listen to what they called this group of people. The pe there was a group of people who were meant to collect all of that. Every day, they'd go out and they would collect it. And they were called the Gabe Siddiqua. The Gabe Siddiqua, the collectors of righteousness. So they called them the collectors of righteousness. Listen to the word again. Gabe Siddiqua. It's where we get the word deacon from. A deacon originally was a man... Who was, who was entrusted by the synagogue to collect the gifts for the poor and then distribute it out. In other words, these people would drop their alms for the poor in and the Gabe Siddiqua, the collectors of righteousness, would collect the acts of righteousness. They would take it and they would make sure that widows and orphans had food for the night and shelter and clothing. They were meant to distribute the acts of righteousness out. Jesus says this. He says, when you give, do not give as someone who sounds a trumpet. In, in other words, it, the, the, the offering basket was shaped like a trumpet. And what people would do is they would take a lot of coins and they would throw it in there real hard in order to make noise so that people would look and see that they'd done their good deed for the day. And they called it sounding the trumpet. The phrase, don't toot your own horn. These sorts of things. It means don't, your good deed should come out of a heart that doesn't need to be noticed. It was hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Maybe we need to define righteousness a little differently. Let, let me give you one key Hebraic thought. And that Hebraic thought for the night is called zakut. Can you say that with me? Zakut. The zakut, the definition of zakut was this. It was a kind and generous act that God notices we do that are not done out of obligation or a result of, of a commandment, but actually out of free will in order to show the love of God to someone else. One rabbi said it this way. I love this. One rabbi said it this way. There is quite a different way of knowing God beyond the Torah, and that way is called zakut. What the rabbis taught is that when you enter into zakut, that you actually see the face of God. You actually connect with God in a different way that is beyond what you can connect with him in, in the study of the word or in worship. That actually, when you do something kind and generous for someone who can do nothing in return, it shows you the heart of God so much that that connects you to God himself. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Amen. Zakut. Let me give you an example of Zakut from the Bible. There's this man named Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was a Roman centurion, which means that he had to proclaim out loud that Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. He has this dream about Peter. And so this dream comes to him, and he has this dream about Peter. And Peter shows up at his house. So you can read about this in Acts chapter 10, if you don't already know the story. So, so Peter shows up at his house. And what does Cornelius do to Peter? Bows down and worships Peter. So here's a man. Follow me. Here's a man who has proclaimed with his mouth that Caesar is Lord. Peter shows up, and he bows down and worships Peter. Peter has to correct him. He says, hey, man, get up. I'm just a man. So here's a man who has proclaimed Caesar is Lord, and he doesn't know that Peter's not God. Would you call him saved? 
under any theology in the world? No. Nah. It's because we're pros at making people out and other people in. Peter says, get up. He gets up. Cornelius says, why are you here? Peter says, God has chosen you to start the first church. Now, here's a man who has proclaimed Caesar is Lord, and he doesn't know it's not right to bow to another man. Would you want him to be your pastor? Yet we're here because of him. And Cornelius asked the same thing you would. He said, why me? This is what Peter says. Because God has already counted you righteous because of your generosity to the poor. You say, Shane, you're messing up my theology. Good. Good. We ought to wrestle with those things. They're in the Bible. We ought to wrestle with them. You say, Shane, have you figured it all out? Nope. But I know this, that I want to look for every opportunity I can to enter into Zakut. I want to look for every opportunity I can to make life happen for somebody else. I, 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 want, to, I, I want to sort of close this out with this scripture. It's something the Lord showed me recently that has really changed my life, and, and I, I want to show it to you. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. It's going to come up on the screen. It says, but I say this. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Each one, as he purposes in his heart, let him give, not of grief or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that in everything, always, having all self-sufficiency, that you may abound to every good work. The word there is tzedakah. In, in other words, in other words that, that, that when you determine in your heart to be a cheerful giver, God is determined to make you abound. And, and that that abundance is only meant to propel you to more sadakas, to more zakut, to more ways to make life happen for other people, to put other people first. Second Corinthians 9.9, 9, as it is written, this is unbelievable. As it is written, he sowed and he has given to the poor. Therefore, his righteousness remains forever. He sows. He gives to the poor. And his righteousness remains forever. Righteousness, generosity, hand in hand, all the way through scripture. Next verse. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for eating, may he supply and multiply your, what's the next word? Seed. And increase the fruits of your righteousness. There, there, all right, let's, let's read those words with a little more gusto, okay? Now, he who provides seed to the sower and bread to the eater, may he supply and multiply your seed and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Once again, generosity, righteousness, hand in hand, hand in hand. For you being enriched or made wealthy, for you being made wealthy in everything to all generosity, which works out praise to God. In other words, us entering into zakut is, is an offering of thanksgiving to God. Now, let me just share something personal with you. And I can only tell you this is my personal story, and it has worked for me. A year and a half ago, I was in January, two Januarys ago, I was fasting and praying for the ministry. And, and, and I live by faith, man. I'm tell, I, I am... I'm just out there, and plane tickets are expensive, and this thing is incredibly expensive to run. To have, to have distribution sites in four different nations cost a lot of money. And so I was going through the different elements of, of the ministry, and I got to the element where I was believing God for finance. And I was doing it like I always did. Now, Lord, I call in increase from the northeast, south, and west. Lord, I ask for your harvest to come in. I was praying just like that, just like I always had, all I knew to do. And the Lord gave me this scripture. He provides seed to the sower. And this thought hit my mind. He provides seed to the sower, not to the one who hoards. And then it says, may God multiply your seed. And it hit me. All through scripture, God is duty bound to provide seed, not harvest. That God provides the seed. And, and based on how we sow, there the harvest comes itself. They, they, you, you look all the way back. God does, God does not give animals grass. He gives a seed, and the seed produces the grass, and it multiplies itself. Manna from heaven. Manna was not biscuit-looking things. 
And in Numbers chapter 7 and 11, it says that manna was hard seed. It came from the sky in the form of seed. And they had to crush it in order to be able to cook with it. That was manna. He provided seed. That God always provides seed. And so this is what I did. This is just my own personal story, and it worked for me, and hopefully it'll work for you. Is instead of believing God for harvest, I changed my focus. And I started believing God for seed. And this is what I said. I said, Lord, I want you to give me a figure to give. Give me a figure that you would like me to give this year. And he gave that figure into my heart, and I started believing for seed. I started believing for that amount to sow. And this was my second prayer. Lord, give me the discernment to sow my seed and eat my fruit. Lord, give me the discernment to know which is seed and which is fruit, so that I may sow my seed and yet eat my fruit with no guilt. And so I started believing God. I, I quit thinking about the harvest altogether. And I started believing God for that seed. Lord, bring life around that seed. Multiply that seed. Give life to that seed. Lord, I'm believing you for this much seed. I'm believing you for this much seed. And as it came in, if I felt the Lord said, that's part of that number seed, I would find a place to give it. And I did it and did it and did it all year long, never thinking about the harvest. At the end of the year, I asked my accountant, how much did we give? And we gave $2,000 more than that figure was. And I said, how was our revenue? He said, you doubled it. And I never thought about it once. All I thought about was the seed. This has taken more pressure off my life than you can possibly imagine. I quit focusing on the harvest and I started focusing on the seed. When I put my attention on other people, God took care of me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who passionately desire to fill the bellies of other people, for God will satisfy them. God provides seed to the sower and bread to the eater. God provides seed to those who sow, not to those who store. May we be a righteous people. And in being a righteous people, may we show tzedakah to the ends of the earth. May we be that person who enters into zakut. So let me make a summary statement. This is a summary statement of this beatitude. The happiest people set their passions on meeting the needs of others. When someone, when someone lives to be generous to others, he is living for zakut. To show God's heart to restore things back to his best. In that, God will determine that he shall be filled in his stomach and in his spirit. There's examples of this all over the world. Cornelius, I had lunch today with Phil and Kath McGee and Tracy Sales. Tracy and, and Robert Sales, they're, they're on staff at the Dream Center in L.A. They're people who've given their life to Zakut. I've been there. I've walked through it. I see the people they minister to. They, what, they, they, I think they feed like 15,000 people a day or something. Unbelievable. They feed people who can't eat otherwise. And they've given their life to minister to the poor. Zakut. And I can tell you, that the rewards are in their life. I look at these kind of examples all over the world. The lady in Johannesburg who said, I'm going to give the rest of my life to pastoring in this squatter camp because God matters to these people. Zakut, zakut, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So let's apply this with four questions. Four questions. It's not my place to tell you where you are. It's only my place to ask the right questions. And then you work it out between you and God. Number one, are you a generous person? Are you generous? I really don't want to know if you tithe. Because I can tell you that there are people who tithe and they're generous. And there are also people who tithe and they're still greedy. That once we start defining those things. No, no, no. I don't care about all that. What I want to know is, is I want to know, are you generous in your heart? Are you generous in your heart? If you face Jesus today, would you be on the right? Or would you be on the left? Hopefully this message at least challenges us to the point where hopefully this week we'll write a check to feed an orphan somewhere. Hopefully, hopefully we'll look for some place to, to show righteousness to somebody. Number two, how have you defined righteousness that needs to change? How have we defined righteousness as all the things we don't do? And if I can, if I can live in a way where I don't do this set of things. No, no, no. Righteousness is about entering into a life of God called zakut. It's about entering into that and showing it to the world. How have we defined righteousness that needs to change? Number three, how can you believe God for seed? What well, if you were to ask God right now, instead of asking God to bless your finances, instead of asking God for a raise, and instead of asking God for all that, try this. I'm telling you, try it for six months. If it don't work, stop, I, whatever. 
But if, if, if try this for six months. Instead of asking God for a raise and finance and all that, this is what I want you to ask God. God, how much do you want me to sow in the next six months? And that figure might be 50 bucks. That figure might be 50,000 bucks. Whatever it is, obey and focus on the seed and watch what happens. God is faithful to provide seed to those who sow. So what, what, what kind of seed can you believe God for? Number four, number four, where can you practice zakut today? Where somewhere? I, I could tell you, if you can't think of any place, let me give you a few ideas. The Dream Center in LA could always use some volunteers to feed people. It's a long plane ride if you don't want to do that. If you don't want to do that, you say, well, I don't have that kind of resources or time. I can tell you this, if you have $25, there's a foundation in Australia that is helping blind people see for $25. They're doing basic cataract surgery in contaminated water areas. And they're taking cataracts off four-year-old girls' eyes so that they can see. 25 bucks, the price of whatever it would cost you to go to coffee club with a friend, can help someone see. That is zakut. There's orphans everywhere. There's no shortage of need. All we have to do is stop and, and cease to be aware of ourselves and look and hunger and thirst to bring righteousness to this world and show the world that God wants to restore all things to itself. May we be people who show righteousness to the world because we're passionately, passionately pursuing the heart of God for other people. Let's pray together. Now, Lord, you're the best, and we proclaim that you are king. You are the king of the universe, and we are not. We are not. If the musicians are still around, I'd like to call them up. And The Lord spoke to me this afternoon, and I just feel like I need to obey him. There's all kinds of ways that we can do altar calls, and there's a way that I could pray for everybody, and we could do that, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with anything, but I, I can tell you this, that, that for me to obey God tonight, I need to let you have your moment with God in repentance. And the Lord told me, I feel like he put on my heart, that your healing and wholeness would come through repentance. That, that, and, and maybe your repent, all repentance means, don't put guilt around it, all repentance means is to change your mind to think about things like God does. That's all it means. It just means to change how you think. So, so, so where tonight, where tonight can you begin to align yourself with the purposes of God for this world. Where can you do that? So I'm going to ask them to just play something soft in the background, and I'm going to open up this altar if you want to come up here. If you don't want to come up here, if you want to just sort of kneel at your seat, I can tell you this, as the environment of repentance comes over this place, that wholeness and healing will begin to settle over you. But don't focus on the wholeness and the healing. That's going to be a harvest. The seed of it is the repentance. The seed of it is the repentance. Focus on the seed. So as they're just playing something now, I'm going to have my own moment of repentance because I've overlooked the poor this week. I, I, I have, I've walked right past people who probably couldn't eat. I, I, and and I, need to, I need to align myself with God. And, and we, need to, we need to come to some sort of an agreement with God tonight that will bring us power as we align ourselves with the purposes of God in this universe. So I'm going to just give us a few moments of silence. And if you want to come up to the altar, you can. If you want to kneel at your seat, you can. You have your moment of repentance with God.
ask you for forgiveness. We ask you for mercy. Forgive us, Lord, for overlooking the poor. Forgive us, God, for neglecting Zakut. Forgive us, God, for putting ourselves first. May we be people who hunger and thirst after righteousness. May we be people who deeply desire to show generosity to this world. Lord, may we deeply desire it deep in our heart to bring life and heaven to other people. Lord, we believe you for seed now. We ask that your seed would begin to settle over us. That your seed would just settle over us and multiply in our lives. Lord, may we be faithful to sow. May we be faithful to enter into Zakut in every form all over the world. Lord, may this place be a dwelling place for your name. The compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, God. May this place be a place of righteousness. Lord, as you promised me this afternoon, I pray that healing and wholeness would begin to settle through this place. As an attitude of repentance has hit this place, I pray that your name would just begin to sweep through this place. Just let it sweep through this place. Would you take your neighbor by the hand? Would you just reach over, take your neighbor by the hand, and we're going to pray for each other? I don't want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about God. And I want you right now to believe for the person on your right hand. Whoever's on your right hand, I want you to believe that the power of God's going to come over them. Lord, we praise the power of God. We praise healing. And we speak wholeness to this person. Lord, as we repent, we, we, are, we collectively, we collectively repent for neglecting Sukkot. Lord, let the name of God settle on the person to my right. Lord, let righteousness be revealed to them. May their needs be met even tonight. Now begin to pray for the person on your left. Just begin to pray for them. And Lord, minister the name of God to that person. Minister the name of God to that person. May righteousness be revealed to them. May the name of God settle over them. Lord, may we collectively be people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. May we hunger and thirst for righteousness. Lord, just begin to minister the power of God to the person on your left. Just to minister the power of God. Now let's pray for this church. Lord, let your name settle over this place. Let your name settle over this place. May this place be a beacon of light in this community. A haven of righteousness. We speak life. We call people in here from the northeast, south, and west. We speak to the community to our left, to our right, to our north, to our south. And we say, may you feel the presence of God in this place. May the life of God go out of this place and touch you, and touch you, and touch you. Maybe you need to think about your neighbor now. Lord, we believe God for our neighbors and our family members. May we show righteousness to them. May we hunger and thirst for Zakut. Lord, may we do, would you use this place to be a dwelling place for your name. If you're here tonight and you've never yet accepted Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to God right now, just responding in your heart to the Lord. And if you you would like to respond to God in your heart, I want everybody to pray a prayer out loud after me with some gusto. But if you'd like to respond to God in your heart, this is your prayer, your moment, your time. And it goes like this. My Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for coming. Thank you for dying for me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I have no hope of saving myself. So I ask you, Lord, to cleanse me, forgive me, come into my heart, and be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to a journey with God. I bless you, church. Yeah, it's awesome. I bless you, church, to know deep inside of you that you serve a God who believes in you more than you believe in Him. I bless you tonight to know deep down inside that God has called you to be a mechanism of righteousness, to show the world what He looks like, to be generous, meet the needs of others. I bless you tonight to know it's your responsibility to enter into Zakut for the whole world. May you know God even deeper because of